All right, so what do we do? Well, I have a bunch of JNATs out on my bench here, and um, I'm going to broach the subject of how to buy a JNAT or how to, you know, evaluate what you're looking for or whatever. It's a common question people always ask, you know, um, you know, I want an ultimate finisher or whatever. And, you know, this is a huge topic. I mean, it's so big that, you know, you can't cover the world of JNATs in a single video or possibly even in a single lifetime. So the discussion about these, it's not this subject, it's these subjects. There's lots of underlying concerns. You know, it becomes uh, an ongoing thing. Initially, though, you know, you're, let's say you have a codicle. You're honing with it. You're happy with it. You think maybe there's something better, for lack of a better term out there, or at least something different that you might like more. And uh, it's kind of natural to look at JNATs. So um, you know, I get a question, you know, I, what am I looking for? You know, this and that. And, you know, one of the first things I'm going to say right out of the gate, you know, just because you're honing on a JNAT does not mean you're automatically guaranteed anything. Right? Using them is a, more about process than it is about the event of the finish. There's a mentality, a zen, a, uh, well, it's a process. Using them that you know, allows you to develop skills, uh, fine-tune your edge to what you want. Um, it's simple, but not easy. It takes practice. Uh, much like anything else in the honing world, practice helps make things better, but it doesn't guarantee anything there either. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some of these stones. And, uh, you know, like if you have questions or whatever, post them in the comments. And maybe I'll make another video on it or just answer it if it's simple enough. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, you know, one question can turn into uh, its own encyclopedia of uh, videos or whatever because, you know, they are pretty complex. You know, for example, right here I have this uh, Ozuko, you know, and you see it's got a stamp, got some more stamp here, you know, um, this is the quarry, Ozuko, well-known, Kyoto mine. Um, so somebody looking for a, a razor finisher, which is a misnomer, right? But uh, you got to start somewhere, so if you use a misnomer, it's not the end of the world. You know, you have uh, some synthetics, and you got to a certain point with them, and you want to uh, expand your repertoire. You know, uh, this particular stone actually would be good. Um, it's pretty hard. Um, it's thick. We'll get to that in a minute. You notice there's no skin on the bottom. Um, that's actually um, a user, an advantage for a user at some level. I'll get to that also. Bench size stone, it's pretty big. You know, uh, this one, what do we got here? Let me get the ruler registered correctly. You know, eight inches, right? So, you've got a lot of length, you got a lot of width. Comfortable. I haven't left this one down, I have sealed it. You know, but uh, what else is there? Well, you know, you got sweeters, you know, chew number, another sweet of a completely different type. And so on. So this is where the confusion comes in. What do I need? What do I want? Where am I going to go? What do I got to do? How do I get there? What does it involve? You know, these things, these rocks, these stones, they grow in the ground. Well, they don't grow like plants, but, you know, they form, you know, like in layers, right? Like, you know, okay, they're just falling apart. They got layers. Uh, something like that, but not exactly like that. Uh, deposits in the ocean, you know, they make these layers, and through time, they compress, they also bend, they twist, they undulate, <clears throat> you know, and uh, and eventually some guy starts digging a hole in the ground, and he finds these layers, these seams, uh, we call them strata, stratum, and um, start acquiring them out and uh, putting them to use. <clears throat> Terms you'll hear. Sweeter. Right. Um, 
continue sweeter is uh, one of the shallow layers um, and there you'll find a bunch of other seams that yield uh, different types of stone um, so you get different looks from these different little seams which you can mark uh, this also comes from Tenu Sweeter. Um, and then way down at the bottom of the pile, you would find two other main seams, Han Sweeter, Shiro Sweeter. Um, those are the uh, you know, pinnacle of stones uh, from the heyday of Japanese whetstones. Um, highly sought after. Um, not too available anymore. Very expensive when they are. I don't have any here, unfortunately. I've had a few. I have a deal on one coming. Well, the deal is pending, actually, on a beautiful hard Shiro Sweeter. Um, you know, but is that a finishing stone? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Honestly, most of the time, Sweeter are not going to give you, on a razor, okay, that edge most okay many times many sweeter will give you a very very nice edge has to be a little harder uh, than most and uh, be a high quality stone so sweeter being classed um, not as a Waseda finishing stone um, become a question you know do I want a sweeter this is a sweeter Nagiyama super hard super smooth I can finish on this, no problem. This stone will finish, you know, as well as any tome or whatever that, you know, someone might sell off as a razor finisher. You know, for the most part, it's not super, super hard. Super hard are my kind of thing. That's what I'm into, but not everybody is. Um, the Ozuko that I had out a second ago, excuse the leapfrogging. All right. This is up there, but not all the way there into super hard land. Uh, super hard, for example, you may have seen it in the video I did uh, Surgical Black <laughs> Ozuko. Um, it's actually a Mizu. This is killer hard. This is really like what I go for. Does that mean this is better than that? <laughs> this better than that? No, it does not. It means it's different. It means my preference is here. It doesn't mean yours will be there. You know, forgive me. I gotta make space. All right. So, you know, starting, uh, you know, at the top, you've got a uh, tenu sweeter, and then as you go down, um, you run into Tome. Tome has like 48 seams in it, so if you see a stone, it's called Tome. What does it mean? Not a whole lot. Those names are for miners, not for end users. So they knew what they were pulling out of the ground. Granted, Tomei produced a lot of usable stone, and that's part of like what it was called that. But um, you know, there are other layers. Asia, Namido, uh, Deep Estratum, also very good, can be very good. Um, but again, there's no guarantees. A stone like this, beautiful stone. Chunagur, uh, this is not quarried in Kyoto, it's outside the Kyoto area. It is not from Aichi, uh, where Makao and Nagura come from. Very nice stone. This one's not so big, but it's not so small. And, um, you know, this particularly, this one is more of a mid range consideration. So when you're looking at names, it's easy to get confused. Um, also, in the names, you have colors. You know, you have uh, Asahi which is green, right? And then, I think I got here, you know, Kita, obviously different. Uh, this is uh, more of a blue-gray type of Asahi. But here you have Kita, um, which is more of a yellow. Kita translates to yellow board or something to that effect. And, you know, it's a yellow stone, basically. But, just because it's yellow doesn't make it Kita. Just because there's some yellow doesn't make it Kita. People have yellow and green together. It's not an Asahi with Kita in it. It's a it's a thing, right? Kita is a thing. So 
then you got to judge by slurry, darkening when wet, and whatever. And you know, people like to say, uh, you know, Asahi are harder than Kita. Sure, for the most part, the stones we see for sale, that's going to often be the case, but it's also um, not unusual to have a super hard Kita. <laughs> I've had them, they're fantastic. Do I get better edges from them than a super hard Asahi? No, I don't. Okay? It's important to judge each stone on its own merits. Names are great. You can tell your friend, I got a Nakayama, Asahi, you know, Copa. That sounds really good, okay, but it doesn't mean much so far as what you're getting off of it. You know? Now, the stamp thing. You got stamps here. Those are cool, you know, right? <clears throat> the infamous. Let's see it right here by my thumb. Maruichi, right? Um, just about every single Maruichi stamp stone I've ever seen has been sold as Nagayama. But I talk to people in Japan and they tell me that not every stone with that stamp came from Nagayama. Uh, I don't know. That stamp, to me, this um, borders on marketing. You know, it could be a brand. I hear that it could be a brand, an old brand, but um, I don't know. Can't find any history on it being a brand. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. Another stamp, Maruka, right here. Okay. Uh, you see the circled one, right? Uh, <clears throat> this is circle is Maru, the inner kanji, uh, Ka, Maruka. Uh, it said the Ka stands for Kato who was one of the early uh, quarry operators at Nagayama. The rest, uh, Shohanyama, original True Mountain. Um, just about everyone will tell you that any stone stamp Maruka, an authentically stamped one, uh, is definitely from Nagayama. Uh, the actual translation of this Maruka stamp, I don't know, you know. Uh, you know, Shohanyama, yeah, okay, over here, I'm good with that, but the Maruka, now, sometimes I wonder um, if we have that story straight. You know, I hear things, but there's no real solid book on it. You know, I'll go with the uh, being attributed to Kato. I'm cool with that. Doesn't mean much. Doesn't mean my edges are going to be better. You know, for people honing razors, uh, these stones um, provide a service, basically. And that service is, uh, you know, sharpening our edge. If you're a Togishi, you know, and you're doing a, you know, Hadori polish on a Nahanto, that things change, right? The needs change, action changes, uh, final result changes. N nobody shaves with a katana, right? Um, and a lot of this history of these stones is about, you know, sharpening swords, but, you know, we use them for razors, um, effectively for razors, and we do very well. But a lot of the history and the reasons that they were so popular for uh, swords doesn't really translate to our world, right? But some does. Anyway, here's another sweeter. Um, I believe this to be over here. I'm not entirely sure. It wasn't stamped. A lot of my stones don't come in with stamps. Um, and, and I lap the stamps off on most stones because I'm honing with them and then whatever. I keep them, I sell them, I trade them. Um, like this one is a little soft. Right? Whereas this puppy, this Maroka, this is really hard. Right? Now, for me, I would position this softer stone um, in the middle of my process. People say pre finish it. You know, that, whatever. You know, everything is pre finished until you finish. Uh, some people finish on stones I consider a pre finish. Um, I don't even like using the term. I like to finish on super hard stones. Most of the stones for me in my collection that I rely on are super hard. This is one of them. Um, this one, obviously I don't use it because it's stamped and if I used it, the stamps wouldn't be there. I've tested it. It's an awesome stone. Did a little work over here and uh, yeah, super hard, super fun. Alright, uh, other considerations, you know, aside from names, you know, width thickness. 
width here is one thing. So, you know, do you cover, whoops, do you cover the whole blade? Yeah. Or are you only working on part of the blade? People like Dennis Stones for working on blades with a warp. Me, I just like whatever stone, I tend to go for wider ones. It's just me. For my hand, something like this fits nice. Right? Something like this requires a little bit of a different grip. If you can see it, I can do this. And that's fine. But with this, critical for me is this thickness because it lets me keep my fingers well below here. If your finger rides up here, I'm not going to be foolish enough, and I do this, boom, you bleed. Bleeding sucks. So we don't want to do that. Now this one, you notice, isn't so thick. So I have to be very careful. So I tend to grip here, you know, and I got to train my finger to not do this, whatever. These are considerations, you know, um, things to think about. So. What else do we want to talk about? Well, you know, skin. The story of skin. Collar. Uh, deposit that form first. Heavier deposits. Iron is involved um, in many cases. It's super hard. This stuff will destroy your edge most of the time. Now, if you have a thin stuff, <clears throat> skin at the bottom becomes a heavy consideration. Now you can't see it, not really, but if you look in here, you know, I don't know if I can really show it like right there, right? Skin continues up. It's not just on the outside like a coating, you know? The first couple of millimeters can be infiltrated with skin, and then there's a hardness change. The stone, as it gets thicker, well, it doesn't get thick, we cut it thick. No skin, but if there was skin, all right. The first few millimeters could be impregnated with skin, which you don't want. Then after that, those first few skin-free millimeters are always, just about in my experience, way harder than what the meat of the stone is going to be like. And this is something to be, you know, concerned with. Not concerned like afraid, but just know what you're dealing with. Like you have a stone like this. And you have skin, and this is like what 16 millimeters. Um, know that your usable portion is probably going to be from where my pinky nail is up. <laughs> all right, now on a softer stone, this is critical because you're going to blow through that fairly quickly if you hone all the time. On this, though, this is like stupid hood, so it's going to be like two generations of people before you get there. But it's something to think about. It's also something to think about when you have a tome on the door. Okay. Um, not every stone has skin. Some do, some don't. This had a little, but for the most part it was free. Sometimes you see chisel marks. I always think that means the miner thought enough of the stone to try and clear it to see what he's got down there. Um, but there's no rules. You know, if there's skin or no skin, it can still be a quality stone. In use, though, I want to keep going back to that, you know, um, somebody goes from 12K Superstone, right, or uh, whatever, uh, you want a finisher. First thing to remember is just because you have a JNAT, you're not automatically guaranteed of having a lightsaber, right? It's just not like that. You have to learn how to work with the stone, you know what I mean? You have to learn how to raise the slurry for this stone. And how to work with it. You know, each one has its own personality. Um, Tome, Namido, Asia. Those layers are very popular for um, razor users. Sweeter too, but not as much as those three. Um, while Asia and Namido are deeper, that doesn't guarantee you a finer particle in the stone or a harder stone. So it's something to remember, you know, a Tome, Asia, and Amido, they can all be soft or hard. It depends on what was going on with the layer at that time. Mm -hmm. Each stone has to be judged on its own merit. 
Now you say, well, then I just want the hardest stone there is. You know, that's, you got to develop a skill to use it. And I'm sorry to sound, you know, snobbish, but if you have a super hard stone, the chances of you landing a laser razor right out of the gate are slim enough. It takes time. Um, this is super hard. It's also has a little pattern in it. Goma, little black dots. Um, those dots on this stone are fine, but not all goma are safe. You have to test. So if you see goma in the name, or karasu, which is this pattern, you know, and there are other patterns. Now CG, uh, Mokume, and all types of the Khan, you know. Um, Kyoto Whetstone Association uh, has gone on record as saying that these patterns are visual, they don't um, affect your honing, but I think what they really mean is, you know, um, you know, goma, the presence of goma doesn't mean you have a better stone. That's what it boils down to. It doesn't mean you have a bad stone either. You have to check it. <clears throat> like little sesame seed dots, you got to look at them with like a forex loop with that. I don't know if you can kind of get a glimpse of them in there. Um, lighting here is terrible, but you know, trust me, they're there. I wonder if I can do this. see some little tiny flecks of black in there trust me it look like little sesame seeds right now people ask what's the best stone hey you know you don't know you gotta try there's no formula this is not about formula you know synthetics go you know 1k 2k 3k 5k 8k done or whatever 12k done 20k done it's like a numerical thing JNATs do not work this way right this stone does not have a k <clears throat> you have to learn to respect the stone. It is what it is. It'll speak to you if you are listening. You listen through your hands. You gotta have feel. You gotta have touch. You gotta pay attention. You gotta hone a lot of blades. What you'll find sometimes is like the stone, the sweeter, you know, that doesn't act like a sweeter, um, will work very well with one or two razors or maybe one or two types of steel with a particular heat treat and temper. In some regards, maybe for finish, maybe for middle ground, but then you have Ochi Gomori, which uh, has this nice purplish hue to it. You know, might do better in other regards. You know, see that in there? Let me see if I can spray that down. Color on this really pops. It's awesome. See that? Look at that ring it's like You hone on this and it bleeds. It's wicked. Right? Um, and this happens to be a stellar piece of Ochi, by the way. Um, a couple of them they're like almost flawless often they're like loaded you know with like impurities and whatever problem veins you got to cut them out you know back to this guy <coughs> excuse me uh, you got all these nice stripes looks like wood that's awesome um, you know, the plain piece of white chew like this uh, would be valued a little less um, at the time of sale but just as effective so sometimes you're just paying for pattern. The pattern is not helping you hone. They help you feel good about the stone, but you know, end result is what matters. Me, I'm a sucker for a pattern. It's terrible. Um, so I'll pay the uh, premium for a prettier stone most of the time. And sweeter, you have these lines. Often, um, sometimes they are highly problematic. Other times they are not. On this one, this is like an Oculus. There's nothing, you can't even feel it. I rub my fingers over it. I can almost not feel it. If this one has a little bit of feel, your razor will never feel it. And then they're soft. What you're worried about is when these lines have uh, deposits in it that um, will scratch your blade. Again, it's thick, no skin, holds nice, easy to work with. You know, so it's a great stone if I want to like cut steel quick. But I wouldn't use that one for a finisher. Back to finishing. What's the best finisher? Okay, for me. Not for you, not for anybody else. For me. Right? Super hard. Why? I'll tell you why. When I'm honing, no particles are coming up. None. Right? I put a slurry on here with a tomo nigger. 
I hone on it, that slurry breaks down, or whatever it does, okay? Um, maybe it just dulls. I, I, I you know, I want to say breaks down, but, you know, there's controversy there, and whatever. I can tell you this, as I hone on it, the edge gets progressively sharper. There is definitely edge refinement going on. I attribute it to breakdown. You can call it what you want. Go get an SEM, go get a team of lab professionals, prove it wrong, whatever, fine. I'm still going to be honing the same way at the end of the day. So without the addition of new particles that are coarser than those that are acting finer, my edge gets sharper. The harder the stone, the more this is prevalent. The softer the stone, the less that's prevalent. If the stone is soft, like this one, it's going to continually kick up more particles. Now, doesn't that mean that the hardest stone is the best stone? No. Yes and no, or maybe not at all. Because all of these things start spinning out of control into a giant potpourri called a progression. And everyone hones differently and every blade is different. So what's good for me with one particular razor at one particular time may not work for you. You know, um, without practice you can't get that slurry where you want it. Um, and you may get frustrated. It's a very hard stone. You can damage an edge really easily on it. The particles in this are friable, but not as friable as they are in the sweeter. So the care must be taken. Still, it's my thing. I like what I call a pushed edge. Make of that what you will. Uh, I like it to uh, burn through my upper lip whiskers without any hesitation uh, for what it's worth on me. Even feathered double-edged blades hang up on my upper lip. People say it's not possible. I'm telling you it is possible. And when I hone off this razor, it doesn't happen. So that edge works for me. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot to be concerned with with these stones. If you're just starting out, you get all these terms, and there's a lot of people talking a lot of smack about what they know, what they don't know. They make it up as they go along. The bottom line. Every stone has to be judged on its own. You talk to somebody you're interested in a stone, they got to know this stone. Not about stones in general, they got to know about the one you're buying. <laughs> you know, and there's no guarantee. You know, someone comes and uh, gets a stone from me. You know, um, it, it may be like a different universe where that guy is, and, and that's normal. And they may struggle with a stone that I had no struggles with. That will happen. The trick is to not get frustrated and blame the stone and the seller and like go flying off the handle. The right thing to do is change your approach. The right thing to do is try a different technique. Other right things to do are start writing things down because you know what, it's a new stone. Maybe you change something and you don't even realize it. You know, slurry density, time on the stone. Um, <laughs> slurry thickness and so on all of this plays in and not every single one is identical you know uh, when I work with this I work with a very thin slight slurry when I work with this thicker right um, if I was gonna work with this big bad Ozuko right, I would probably start off with a lighter type of slurry but it would probably be a little heavier than this and then I would sort of gauge it see what I was getting and then back off until I hit like that sweet spot. Time on the stone, you don't know. There's no clock on this. You got to feel it. Um, pressure uh, is one of the main things and then the other thing is the friability of the particles which is never guaranteed. You know. So um, <laughs> if you're not more confused now than you were before, um, this is going to be uh, the first installment on what is probably going to be a whole bunch of videos about, you know, different types of things uh, concerning, you know, someone getting into J-Nets. Um, it's enough to talk about finishing sometimes, but, you know, there's a whole world that comes up before that. You know, um, and not everybody likes J-Net edges. You know, not everyone's going to like mine or yours or somebody else's. And There's no one J-Net edge that speaks for everyone out there. So what's nice about this, this world, rather, and any natural stuff, the same holds true for particles and whatever else, you know, you get to make adjustments and fine-tune everything, and that's where the joy is. You know, you get the edge where you want it for your face, you know. 
but um, coming into this world, uh, which is a little different than codicles, it's important to realize that there's no recipe, you know. You cannot say Ozuko is harder than Nakayama, is harder than Shobu. People who say stuff like that are out of their minds, all right. Um, every stone is different. You know, Azuka are very consistent. A lot of stones from there are very hard. Yes, I'll, I'll acquiesce to that. But the fact of the matter is, is I've had soft Azukos. I've had Azuka Sweeters. And not everyone is hard. And not everyone was like, you know, this killer winner that I just, you know, couldn't live without. Um, this stone here, I'll probably die with it. People have offered me a lot of money for it. They ain't getting it. Right? Um, this is a brilliant brilliant piece of what I believe to be Nakayama. It has a Maroka stamp, but that doesn't mean spit. It's got a bad cut. <laughs> it was cracked from a full-size stone. Look at that. I mean, you know, who looks at this and says, wow, that's great. Um, I had a good feeling about it, and uh, as much as that's really precarious, and part of me wants to cut it off, I'm leaving it because it gives me real estate. Um, and the first time I owned on it, I was like, wow, jeez, wow, holy crap, this is awesome. You know? And um, I'm guaranteeing you, if I sold it and somebody got it, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, and that's how it goes. So forget the recipe. Um, take each stone individually. You know, if you have questions, shoot me an email. Anybody that, like, already knows me or has already done that will tell you the same thing. I'll tell you the straight story. No bullshit. I, you know, I don't care. Don't buy a stone from me. Buy it from someone else. Uh, what I won't do... I will not give opinions on other people's stones for sale because that's ridiculous, okay? But I will talk openly about what I know about, you know, using them, stones I have, different layers, different tri uh, techniques and tricks and what have you, that I'm good with. But like, don't email me about somebody else's stone they sell because that's just bad form. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Bought one, J-Nuts, how to get in.